The title of this presentation is What is in a name? Can a word hinder needed therapies? It is based on a lecture that I gave in 2015 at the Methodist Research Institute in Houston, Texas. The title was suggested by my observations after 45 years of treating cancer patients experiencing pain and other bothersome symptoms. My major concern is that in the United States, needed therapies may be refused or delayed due to a misperception and possible negative connotation that many people associate with names such as hospice and palliative care. I will attempt to explain the reasons of the short, median length of stay in hospice and palliative care in the United States by providing a brief historical overview of supportive care, cancer pain therapy, hospice and palliative care. Unless we clearly define a concept, the end result will be that of great confusion. The first question may seem very obvious, but I have no clear idea what is end-of-life care. Is it the care of a patient during the last 24, 72 hours of life? Or the care for several days, weeks, months, or even years? A patient with severe dementia, housebound, unable to take care of himself or herself, at times for several years, does he or she qualify for hospice or end-of-life care? The next question then is, are we reaching our goals? The most recent statistics available, those of 2013, tell us that about 43% of all deaths in the United States are followed by hospice. Of this, about 36% have a cancer diagnosis, while 64% have other terminal diseases. However, the median length of stay in hospice is that of 18.5 days. In other words, 50% of hospice patients are followed by hospice for less than three weeks. Other simple statistics reveal that only 20% of patients followed by hospice spend more than three months with the program. In an attempt to answer these questions, a brief review of the evolutions of medical care and the development of cancer pain therapy, hospice, and palliative care is in order. For thousands of years, medicine was unable to cure diseases. Some powerful plant extracts were able to diminish some symptoms. Thomas Sidham a famous 17th century British physician, consider also the English Hippocrates, wrote, without opium, the healing art would cease to exist. As opium not only decreased pain, but also controlled cough, dysentery, and anguish. Surgery was rarely performed by a physician. Barber, often provide bloodletting and perform simple operations. Of the surgical procedures performed, amputations due to trauma, wars, infections, had to be performed in a few minutes. Only young, healthy individuals could survive the pain of the surgery. Other procedures included simple incisions and drainage of abscesses and tooth extractions. As recent as 170 years ago, appendicitis, cholecystitis, pneumonia, typhoid fever, and other serious infections were deadly diseases. Survival was due to the patient's inner resources, mostly his or her immune system. There is an interesting anecdote. Physicians in the Middle Ages were instructed to minimize the seriousness 
of the prognosis to the patients in order to maintain all of his or her strength as size as possible. But at the same time, the family should have been given little hope of the patient's survival. The implication was that if the patient survived, that was certainly due to the skill of the physicians. Century of clinical observations must have demonstrated that stress patients did not fare as well as hopeful ones. We now know that stress can seriously depress the immune system. As the 18th century ended and the 19th century evolved, medicine started to enter the modern era. At the end of the 18th century, the English physicians Edward Jenner popularized vaccinations. In the 1840s, in the Puritan United States of America, anesthesia, in particular ether anesthesia, was rediscovered and in a matter of a few months was being used around the world. Now surgery was able to flourish and some procedures could cure diseases that a few years before were uncurable. The discovery of bacteria as a cause of infection led to the development of antiseptic techniques. This also led to the decrease in puerperal fevers and maternal mortality. Drastic improvement in sanitations and public health prevented many infection diseases and the discovery of antimicrobial drugs improved survival from infections. Medical schools started to teach curative methods and gradually stopped teaching the importance of caring for patients and their family when cure is not more possible. As a result, patients with non-curable diseases often were abandoned by the medical profession suffering severe pain and other debilitating and distressing symptoms. Most patients, especially in the United States, were subject to aggressive curative treatments, also when no cure was possible. Not only medicine focused on discovering and using only curative therapies, but society as a whole, especially in the United States, asked for prolongation of life regardless of cost and quality of life. Dying is now seen as a failure of the medical profession, and it is often implied that when a patient dies, it is because he or she did not fight hard enough. Over 70 years ago, a few healthcare professionals noted and reacted to these tragic situations. In the late 40s, Cicely Sanders, working as a social worker, noted the need of effective end-of-life care and in the 60s started the hospice movement. In 1944, John Bonica developed the multidisciplinary approach to improve the treatment of pain. In 1953, he also wrote on the need of effective pain and symptom control for patients with advanced cancer. In the 70s, Balfour Mount in Canada started the palliative care movement. In 1944, John Bonica, after an abbreviated residency in anesthesiology, was named director of anesthesia at the largest United States Army hospital near Tacoma in the state of Washington. It was also ordered to treat the pain that many wounded soldiers suffered. Bonica, at that time just 27 years old, had already had a very interesting life. Because of his father's death a few years after the family had migrated to the United States, the young Bonica, to maintain himself to school and to help the mothers and sister, became a professional wrestler. He continued this career in incognito, 
while he attended medical school. In 1941, he won the light heavyweight championship of the world, and because of his wrestling career, in 2004, he was inducted to the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame. In an autobiographical recording entitled Wrestling with Pain, he later recalled his professional lives, both as a young wrestler and a physician. As a physician, his lack of knowledge about pain therapy that he had to provide to the wounded soldiers caused great frustration. This frustration was the trigger of the multidisciplinary approach to pain therapy. In this audio clip, he describes the reasons for starting the multidisciplinary approach. Obviously, I was frustrated because uh, I couldn't handle the problems. I then contacted uh, colleagues in neurosurgery, neurology, and other places to help, and found that the usual uh, traditional method of communication, that is, for the patient to be seen by each of the consultants and then to try to get this information was a very difficult, time-consuming, inefficient task. And so I got the bright idea, I thought, of getting them together at lunch to discuss these pain problems. And this was really the beginning, the concept of the multidisciplinary uh, uh, program, approach to uh, pain diagnosis therapy. Now, by 1945, uh, within about nine, ten months of experience, I had become fully convinced that there was, first of all, lack of education of physicians in pain therapy. I asked all, all the other specialists said the same as I said, I had no training in pain. There was a need for the widespread application of this multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, approach to pain diagnosis and therapy. And I also felt the, at the time, uh, because research on pain was almost non-existent, that there was need for this approach to pain. Uh, early on, I realized there was a need for communication, taxonomy, classification of pain. And there was a need for a textbook on what I was attempting to do. In 1953, Bonica, in a chapter on cancer, included in his book, The Managing of Pain, he wrote regarding pain therapy. The deplorable attitude of defeatism and apathetic therapeutic inactivity must be abandoned and replaced by courageous aggressiveness tempered by sane judgment. He added that cancer patient needed the psychological support, the sympathy, the understanding, the kindness, and the moral support of their physicians. He further commented on the need of company, as he wrote that, it is the alleviation of misery not to suffer alone. And finally he added, supporting measures are also necessary, such as nourishing food, good hygiene, and competent nursing care. In the late 40s, Cicely Sanders, working as a social worker in London, noted how poorly dying patients were being treated, often without any support. She was mostly affected by the poor treatment that David Tasmas, a young Polish immigrant dying of cancer, was receiving. As she began to speak out against this unacceptable situation, she was advised that if she wanted her concern be taken into serious consideration by the medical profession, she should become a physician. She enrolled in medical school and graduated in 1956. By 1967, she had raised enough capital to be able to open the freestanding St. Christopher Hospice for the care of the dying patients. The word hospice is a Latin word meaning 
a shelter for the traveler. It can be used to mean a shelter for the actual traveler or figuratively a shelter for a person involved in the journey of life. Both type of hospices were common in the Middle Ages. In the mid 1800s, the Sister of Charity opened the hospice for the dying in Dublin. In 1905, San Joseph Hospice, a hundred bed facility, opened in London. In 1967, Cecil Sanders opened the St. Christopher Hospice also in London. When Cecily Sanders opened St. Christopher Hospice, there were several hospices in England. They were run by nurses, as physicians were involved in curing diseases and hospice patients were uncurable. The philosophy of St. Christopher, promulgated by Cecily Sanders, was that physicians had to be intimately involved to provide not only excellent patient care, but also education and research. She believed in an holistic approach. This included caring for the patient's physical, spiritual, psychological well-being, as well as providing support for the patient's family. Dr. Sanders introduced the concept of total pain, which includes physical, emotional, social, both interpersonal and financial, and spiritual aspects. To foster research at St. Christopher, she recruited Robert Tycross. In 1973, Balfour Mount, a surgical oncologist at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal, realized how poorly dying cancer patients were being treated. He spent one week with Dr. Sanders at the St. Christopher Hospice to learn the basic concept of end-of-life care. Upon returning to Canada, he realized that he could not completely implement the St. Christopher model. For economic reasons, he could not open a freestanding institution. Instead, he opened an entire ward dedicated to the care of patients at the end of life. He developed a team of experts that could be deployed and consulted by other wards who could provide suggestions on therapeutic interventions. He also developed a home reach program and follow up bereavement support. Furthermore, since Canada uses both English and French as their national languages, he realized that the word hospice had negative connotation in French, as it is used to describe a nursing home where poor people are institutionalized until they die. Dr. Mount called his program Palliative Care and the new movement was born. In the United States in the 60s, many relatives of patients that had died after futile aggressive therapies, often spending days and weeks in the intensive care unit being mechanically ventilated started to organize and to react to the de depersonalization of care for the terminally ill patients. The majority of the early organizers of this grassroots movement were not medically trained. They felt that the care for the dying patients could best be delivered at home and not in an institution. They blamed the medical system for the situations and planned to develop an organization independent of the medical establishment. In 1985, one of the earlier organizers of the hospice movement in the United States so recalled the experience. We were all just mad. We sat in my living room. We all had horror stories. We were angry at the doctor, the nurse, someone. After a while, we realized that our loved one might have received better care if he was at home. It was the place of care that caused the problem. All of us had had a bad experience with the hospital. Now we knew what to do. Let us face it. 
We did not know anything. It sounded like a good idea. We envisioned a cadre of volunteers, neighbors who would help each other during the final stages. The news articles were always the same. They had testimonials from people who described the beauty of death. It's funny, things changed. They became so different once we really got started. We realized we needed to provide more than emotional and moral support. We had to do actual physical patient care. This boggled our minds. We did not know how or where to begin. We had to expand our group. These early interest groups without medical directive pressures legislators to enact death with dignity legislation. In 1974, the Hospice of Connecticut opened. In the late 70s, hospice movement realized that they had to integrate with the medical system. In 1978, the National Hospice Organization was founded, and in 1979, Flexner, in an attempt to include physicians in the hospice movement, define hospice to be a medically directed nurse coordinated program providing a continuum of home and inpatient care for terminally ill patients and their family. It employs an interdisciplinary team acting under the directions of an autonomous hospice administrator. The National Hospital Organization, in order to convince the United States Congress to include hospice benefit in Medicare benefits. It marked the program as a program that would provide huge saving for the health care cost in the United States. In 1982, Congress enacted hospice legislation, making hospice benefits elective and associated with several caveats. Briefly, by selecting hospice, the patient loses other Medicare benefits. All care is provided by hospice and reimbursements to hospice is fixed and capped. Over 80% of the care had to be provided in the patient's home. By the early 80s, England and Canada had developed programs for end-of-life care that have been conceived and directed by physicians and which were fully recognized and funded by the respective healthcare systems. In the United States, instead, the hospice movement had developed with little involvement of the medical profession and was poorly funded by Medicare. Each individual not-for-profit hospice was expected in part to support itself with private philanthropic donations. Hospices in well-to-do areas receive much higher donation than those in poorer or rural areas. The result of variable donations led to an uneven economic status of each single hospice, which resulted in variable care that they could provide to their patients. In 19 76, while these programs were gradually being developed in England, Canada, and the United States, a reaction of an Italian family to the pain and suffering experienced by a relative with advanced cancer triggered a series of events that led to a worldwide attention in a relatively short period of time to the physical and emotional suffering associated with advanced cancer. In 1977, in Milano, Virginio and Loredana Floriani founded La Fondazione Floriani, or the Floriani Foundation. Virginio Floriani had recently lost his brother, Bruno, because of prostatic cancer. As Bruno was suffering excruciating pain from his metastatic disease that his oncology was unable to treat, Mrs. Floriani, a volunteer at the Cancer Institute in Milano, approached Vittorio Ventafrida, 
the director of anesthesiology and pain therapy of the institute. Ventafrida intervention provided significant pain control for Bruno. That, as Mrs. Floriani later stated, allowed him to die with dignity. As the result of their experience, the Floriani asked Ventafrida for suggestion on how to correct this tragic situation. Ventafrida contacted Bonica, already recognized as the world leading pain expert. In fact, Bonica had published in 1953 his comprehensive book, The Management of Pain. In 1973, he had invited 339 world pain experts to meet in Issaquah, a small town near Seattle. At the end of the meeting, the participant had agreed to found the International Association for the Study of Pain. Also, they appointed Patrick Wall as the director-in-chief of the new scientific journal Pain. And they agreed to organize every three years a World Congress on Pain. In 1975, the first World Congress on Pain Research and Therapy had taken place in Florence. Bonica and Ventafrida agreed that the most efficient way was to convene the world leaders in cancer pain therapy and research. In 1978, from the 24th to the 27th of May in Venice, the International Symposium on Pain in Advanced Cancer was held. The symposium was fully funded by the Floriani Foundation. Over 50, 50 speakers gave lectures on cancer pain related subject. In recognition of the groundbreaking work of Cecily Sanders and Robert Tycross, they were invited to give three lectures. Over 500 people attended the symposium and the proceedings were published the next year. In this picture, Dame Cecily Sanders and Victoria Ventafrida about 20 years later. The success of the symposium prompted Jan Steinhauer, the chief of the World Health Organization Cancer Section, to ask the organizer of the symposium if they could help the World Health Organization to develop simple inexpensive guidelines for cancer pain therapy. Again, with the financial support of the Floriani Foundation, Bonica convened in 1982 several cancer pain specialists. They met in Villa d'Este on Lake Como. The guidelines developed at the meeting were published and titled Cancer Pain Relief. The Floriani Foundation continues to support palliative care in Italy and palliative care education around the world. This picture depicts several members of the team convened by Bonica. John Bonica, Mark Swerlo, Robert Tycross, Cathy Foley, Vittorio Ventafrida, and Jan Steinward. The first edition of the World Health Organization booklet, Cancer Pain Relief, containing the developed guidelines. Several editions of the booklets were published and it was widely diffused by the World Health Organization. In the 80s, the hospice movement in the United States, mostly as a grassroots volunteers movement with very little medical directions, started to develop and expand. At the same time, the major National Cancer Institute, pain and symptom relief programs were being developed. For example, in the mid-70s, Kathleen Foley was asked to develop and direct a cancer pain relief programs at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Hospital in New York. At MD Anderson, Charles Cleland fostered pain and symptom research and therapy, and later Eduardo Bruera, which was trained by Neil McDonald, one of the early pioneers in the treatment, education, and research in palliative care, was recruited to lead the palliative medicine program. Other newer institutions, like the Fred Hutchinson in Seattle 
and the James Cancer Hospital in Columbus, all developed cancer pain relief programs. In the mid-90s, to overcome the negative perceptions and the economic limitations of the hospice program, palliative care started to be recognized in the United States as a medical discipline that was able to provide long-term medical care for pain and symptom control. But, in my opinion, it continued to be closely associated with the hospice program. For instance, the National Hospice Organization became the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, and there was no effective educational effort to convince society and the medical establishment of the major difference between the two programs. In 1975, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Institute had opened in Seattle. Bonica, as the result of his involvement in Cancer Pain Symposium and the development of the World Health Organization guidelines, started long negotiations with the leadership of the Fred Hutchinson to develop a pain service in the Institute. It was finally agreed that the program was going to be called Pain and Toxicity Program. It would treat mostly pain, nausea and vomiting and other distressing physical symptoms. It would also provide psychological care and support. Being an anesthesiology director service, it would provide analgesia and sedations for painful procedures like lumbar punctures, bone marrow aspirations, simple biopsy, especially for children. It would provide education for residents and would expand the pain research program. In 1990, one of the dreams of uh, Arthur James and oncological surgeons at the Ohio State University became a reality. The Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital and Research Institute had just opened on the Ohio State University Columbus campus. Dr. James was well aware that cancer is very often associated with severe pain and other distressing symptoms, not only at the end of life. When the Kobacher family offered him a larger donation to build a hospice associated with the James Cancer Hospital, he refused. The Kobacher House and Hospice was opened by the Methodist Hospital also in Columbus, and presently Dr. Charles Van Gunten is the Vice President of Medical Affairs of the Hospice and Palliative Medicine Program. Indeed, Dr. Jame was an early pioneer of the basic comprehensive concept of palliative care, even if he did not use the term. He recognized the importance of pain and symptom controls relief not only during the periods of acute treatment or during the end of life, but during the entire course of the disease. His dream was that one day cancer could be easily cured and therefore pain and symptoms associated with it would cease to exist. To reach his goal, he devoted much time to community organizations and in 1972 he was elected national president of the American Cancer Society. His concept of an holistic approach to the care of cancer patients was recognized several years later by the Ohio Division of the American Cancer Society. From 2003 to 2006, it funded in his honor at the Ohio State University, one of the first year-long fellowships in the United States in cancer pain and palliative care. He was adamant that a cancer pain and symptom control program be instituted in his hospital. He fully supported a program that would provide pain and symptom control, both physical and existential, from the time of cancer diagnosis until they were needed using both inpatient and outpatient services. The members of the initial multidisciplinary team included the physicians, nurses, a psychologist, a pharmacist, and several mental health nurses. Other services, such as social workers, 
occupational therapy, pastoral care were easily accessible to the members of the team. The most frequent first patient encounter was for the treatment of postoperative pain. However, at times, medical and radiation oncologists would refer patients to us. After hospital discharge, we would follow the patients in our outpatient clinic for as long as needed, at time for several years, as cancer continues to evolve into a chronic disease but is often associated with chronic cancer or therapy-related pain. The intensity of our involvement varied with the intensity of the symptoms. During our weekly meetings of the multidisciplinary team, we would discuss the most difficult patients. The patient's oncology, nurses, and the patient caregiver were invited as necessary. We did not have a home care support service until the hospice program was opened in 1997. However, the program was terminated two years later because of very late and low referral rate from oncologists and being considered an economic burden to the hospital. This slide tries to show the concept of the interactions of curative medicine and pain and symptom controls at the James. It highlights the intensity of the involvement of each depending on the stage of the disease. That interaction fits the World Health Organization definition of palliative care. For the World Health Organization, the definition of palliative care is palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families with the problem associated with life-threatening illnesses. It further says it is applicable early in the course of the illness in conjunctions with other therapies that are intended to prolong life, such as chemotherapy and radiation therapy. It includes those investigations needed to better understand and manage distressing clinical complications. One of the confusion regarding palliative care, at least in the minds of many Americans, is the durations of involvement in the care of a patient. Ben Rich is the professor and chairman of the Department of Bioethics at the University of California at Davis. His major field of interest are education, research, and the ethical issues related to pain medicine and palliative care. He was the RD of the 10th Maria Luisa Ferrari Lectureship for Life. In his 2009 lecture entitled Palliative Care Education and the Culpability of Cultivated Ignorance, he clearly defined palliative care. First of all, I wish to define palliative care as broadly as possible. It's the relief of pain and suffering. Therefore, by that definition, all patients who experience pain and suffering are entitled to quality palliative care. This is not something that is reserved for the critically ill or the dying. Unfortunately, this definition is not shared by many people and hospital in the United States, including now even the James Cancer Hospital, as it equates palliative care with end-of-life care. This greatly hinders the referrals from oncologists. Many patients and their family refuse it until a few days before death, since they see no distinctions between palliative care and end-of-life care, and therefore associate palliative care with, with imminent death. Returning to the 2013 statistic, as I've mentioned at the beginning of my presentations, 42.5% of all patients that die in the United States are followed by hospice care. 36.5% had cancer diagnosis. A simple calculation reveals that about 70% of 
of all cancer patients die under hospice care. The other 63.5% of hospice patients suffer from dementia, heart or lung diseases, strokes, coma, and other more rare terminal illnesses. The median length of stay is of 18.5 days, less than three weeks. The average length of stay is 72.6 days. This bar graph shows in more details the length of stay. 35% of hospice, hospice patients have a length of stay of less than seven days. 80% have less than three months and only 11% are care for over six months. The median and average length of stay are too short. Dame Cecily Sanders estimated end-of-life care for cancer patients in the 70s to be at least of six weeks. By today's standard, it should be much longer. As about two-thirds of patients in hospice care today do not have a cancer diagnosis, the terminal phase is prolonged. Therefore, the median and the average length of st stay should be significantly longer. In conclusion, no one can deny that the hospice and palliative care movements have been fundamental in and instrumental in decreasing suffering and improving the care of terminally ill patients and their families. However, in the United States, they have many limitations. In most people's mind, they are not clearly different and conjure negative connotations. We need a program that clearly provides pain and symptom controls, including both physical and existential symptoms for people affected with serious diseases from the onset until the cure or the demise of the patients. The same program should provide support for the patient's family, and its name should inspire a positive perspective. We must remember a very keen and true observation of Albert Schweitzer. Pain is a more terrible lord of mankind than even death himself. In reality, most people do not fear death, but a prolonged, painful, suffering, dying process. Therefore, what would be more enticing for patients and their family than to join a program dedicated to the relief of what is most feared, pain and suffering. A program that clearly, simply and without ambiguity is called Pain and Symptom Relief Program. The program must be comprehensive and it must include in its mission exemplary care and, whenever feasible, education and research in pain and symptom relief as well as the concept of palliative care in hospice. I'd like to conclude these presentations with some reflection-inducing comments by Ben Rich. There is at least a superficial irony in the proposition that patients whose moderate to severe pain is time-limited by a terminal prognosis should be offered whatever level of opioid analgesia is necessary to relieve their pain. Well, patients with the same level of pain that could persist for years must receive suboptimal pain and symptom management for their own good. The latter group would seem to be more deserving of aggressive therapy than the former. During the informal discussion that followed the presentations, three important comments were made. Dr. Neil McDonald a pioneer and internationally recognized leader in palliative medicine, re-emphasized the basic concept that palliative medicine must be provided to every patient at the time a serious life-threatening disease is diagnosed and must be clearly distinguished from end-of-life care. Sir Thomas Hughes from London made two interesting points. In Great Britain, 
the increase of in funding for military veterans and for hospice care are frequently requested to the government. Even more interesting was how patients are referred to hospice care. In England, physicians are instructed at each patient's encounter to ask themselves the question, will I be surprised if these patients will be alive next year? If the answer is yes, referral to hospice is initiated and in so doing, hospice care in Great Britain is much longer than it is in the United States.